Hello, you are welcome. Today's lecture is going to be on the gastrointestinal tract. This is a part two of an earlier recording, and this is going to feature the oesophagus to the stomach. The earlier video captured the oral cavity, so we looked at the lip, we looked at the tongue, we looked at uh, salivary glands. So if you haven't looked at that video yet, uh, this is a sequel to it. So you have to uh, quickly look at it and then continue with this video. I'm Eric Edu and I'm glad to have you. I want to start by looking at the formation of the esophagus um, from the primitive gut. That is the foregut. So here you can see that Initially, you have one tube, and you have a green part, a purple part, and a yellow part, and the yellow part is constricting in the midline, okay? That is going to form the tracheoesophageal septum, and that is what is going to sever the continuity of the header to uh, common entrance. Now, the pharynx is the common opening uh, for both the respiratory and the digestive tract. Histologically, it is uh, seen to have a stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium with some prominent elastic fibers in the lamina propria. You can also see a lot of uh, striated muscle um, at the inferior portion. So these have been cut in a transverse or cross section. So you are seeing profiles of muscles in fascicles. Uh, okay. Um, you know that you have these uh, fascicles together bounded by a connective tissue to form the muscle in a hole. The oesophagus is a 25 centimeter long uh, structure. It can be divided into three portions, the cervical, thoracic, and abdominal portions. It is protective for that matter. It is stratified. So we describe it as stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium. It has an upper one third, middle, and lower one third, but all of them having different um, composition. So the upper one third is striated fully, middle is a mixture of smooth and striated, and then the lower portion is um, smooth muscle. It delivers food and liquid from the pharynx to the stomach. And um, as I said earlier on, it has an upper one third with full striation, a middle portion with a mixture of the smooth and the striated muscle, that is skeletal muscle, and then the last portion is the smooth muscle. And this also accounts for the fact that at a point in swallowing, you can't bring out the food when it gets to the smooth muscle area because that is what under involuntary um, response, unlike the striated portion where you can voluntarily bring the food out. The oesophagus is connected to the stomach uh, by a sphincter. Okay, so that is the oesophageal sphincter. Now, when you look at the stomach, you have the body, the fundal region or the fundus. You also have the pyloric region, which connects to the duodenum. These are some of the cells you find in the stomach. Okay, you have the chief cells, parietal cells, and mucous cells all line up along its epithelium as it folds downwards into a pit and rises up again. If you look at the general architecture of the GI, it follows this pattern. You have a lumen in the middle followed by a mucosa, a submucosa, and then muscularis externa, and then finally the serosa or adventitia as to whether it is connected to the body wall or it is suspended in the peritoneum. So if it is connected to the body wall, you have the adventitia. Now, looking at the uh, stages that I have outlined or the regions, mucosa, submucosa, and then muscularis externa and adventitia. You have to look at this uh, four layers in details. So we want to take the mucosa which will be made up of the epithelium lamina propria and then the muscularis mucosa. The epithelium is the first layer you encounter when you are moving away from the lumen. 
the lamina propria is a loose type of connective tissue and the muscularis mucosa is a smooth muscle. The submucosa is a dense connective tissue okay, and could have a lot of um, glands associated with it. The muscularis externa is made up of the inner circular and outer longitude now. And we know that uh, in the stomach you have an innermost oblique. The oesophagus will follow the trend uh, of architecture we have seen so far. So the mucosa with the epithelium is non-keratinized. The mucosa has some glands known as the oesophageal cardiac glands. Then you also have an extensive muscularis uh, mucosa. Then the sub mucosa also contains some glands known as the oesophageal gland proper, followed by the muscularis externa. Sometimes we call that the muscularis propria, uh, having the inner circular muscle and outer longitudinal muscle. So in a histological micrograph, this is what you see. The surface, which is the epithelium of the mucosa, is stratified squamous. Okay, so you can see stratification, several layers of cells. That's the lamina propria, loose connective tissue, muscularis mucosa, showing some smooth muscle. This is a gland. All right, and you can see a duct, one duct here, and then one duct there as well. So these glands are actually in the submucosa because the muscularis mucosa is showing the limit for the mucosa. Okay, so that is for the oesophagus. It's very easy to identify. This is a, an oesophagus with a, a closed or collapsed lumen. Okay, so um, you have to um, be abreast with this. The pronounced feature of this particular micrograph uh, is the uh, muscularis externa. Okay, so you can see the muscles running in different orientation because one is running longitudinally and the other is running circularly. So once it is cut, they are going to have two different profiles. So you can see the one below there has a different profile compared to the inner one. Then this is also showing uh, some glands within the oesophagus. We have mentioned that you can find some of the cardiac glands in the mucosa and then you have oesophageal glands proper in the submucosa. So that is what you see there in the submucosa. You also see a very good outline of the stratification in the mucosa epithelium which is very striking for the oesophagus it is for protection because of the swallowing action sometimes we swallow very uh, solid um, less lubricated uh, bolus and this is there to help now when you look at the muscularis externa it has uh, embedded within it the myenteric plexus which helps in contraction and realization of the muscle to help in peristalsis okay so the wave-like contraction will help move the bolus down to the stomach so that is one of the major importance of these uh, muscularis external muscles within which you have the myenteric pleasures also known as the outbatch pleasures at the gastroesophageal junction you have the inner circular uh, being um, enhanced okay to form a sphincter at the junction so you can see there is huge muscle in the middle portion and you can also see on the left and right the oesophageal portion and then the cardiac or the stomach portion so oesophageal portion has stratification and then the stomach portion is columnar so once we enhance this micrograph you appreciate the columnar nature of the stomach now the submucosa of the stomach uh, joins that of the mucosa and throws the lining of the stomach into folds known as rugae okay this is uh, in effect to help increase the surface area to volume ratio so you can see that the submucosa uh, with a very high eosinophilic um, staining that is pinkish is thrown into folds together with the mucosa you also find some glands there and then the muscularis externa is also showing so this 
in all helps to uh, increase surface area to volume ratio. The gastric or fundic glands are also there to aid in digestion. Okay, so you have the gland containing stem cells, mucous neck cells, parietal cells, chief cells, and then you also have enteroendocrine cells within the stomach. All this uh, in an attempt to help achieve uh, maximum uh, function of the stomach. You should also appreciate that the, the stomach lining is thrown into folds, okay, and therefore it forms pits. So this is an example of one uh, portion being thrown into a fold. It goes down, okay, and then comes up again. And by so doing, it forms a pit. And within this pit, you can have glands secreting their substance into it, just like any uh, ordinary duct gland, that is the exocrine type of gland, always have a duct to which they secrete their substance. So you can see lying up along the line are the secretory portions okay so you can have a uh, surface mucous cells you can also have the neck mucous cells and then the other glands at the lower portion so gastric glands in the stomach also uh, here showing you how the glands appear so mucous of the mucous surface cells and they also have mucus of the mucus neck cells. All right. This is a past stain, a periodic acid shift stain. This uh, helps to uh, stain these mucus areas for you to appreciate them better. You can also see how the mucus appear when it is not the periodic acid shift. This, uh, not picking much of the stain like you saw in the earlier slide. So deep piece open to relatively straight glands, mostly mucous cells. Occasionally you have parietal cells. Also all these uh, white areas are mucous uh, secreting cells all along. Okay, and this helps uh, to protect the lining of the stomach uh, against some of the acidity. You have in that region. Then, once you move from the gastric region, uh, the food moves towards the duodenum, which is the first part of the um, small intestine. So, again, you have a sphincter, okay, or a junction there. So, the sphincter is there to regulate the amount of uh, food or chime that enters the duodenum. So, again, the inner circular is enhanced as you can see to form a sphincter you should be able to tell the lining epithelium of the stomach and that of the duodenum we will cover the duodenum in the next lecture so this is just an introduction for you to see how the duodenum will appear as against that of the stomach the stomach is simple columnar the duodenum is also simple columnar however there's a big difference between their submucosa in the uh, line of uh, glands. So you have glands in the submucosa, very prominent ones in the duodenum, as against that of the stomach. So that is one of the ways you differentiate between the stomach and then the duodenum. This is also uh, showing you the pyloral duodenal junction, that is the pyloric region of the stomach and then the duodenum. The duodenum is on the right and then the pyloric region of the stomach is on the left. And you can see that on the right you have in the submucosa presence of some glands, but on the left it is huge muscles, okay, it's huge muscle and this is contributing to the formation of the sphincter, All right, good. So the next slide will also show something similar to what we have here. Yes, so again, something similar, but this time around, you are seeing the uh, submucosa glands of the duodenum proper, okay, as compared to the earlier slide. And you can see the huge muscles you find in the left side of the 
pyloric region of the stomach. Okay. So bear in mind these architectural differences. It will help in differentiating between these two regions histologically. Okay, so remember the submucosa uh, gland in the duodenum, very, very prominent in the duodenum. Again, this is to also um, emphasize on what I've been saying so far between the difference between the stomach and then the duodenum. On the right, you can see the uh, submucosa glands. And you can always tell the difference between the submucosa uh, and other parts of the, the lining because of the muscularis externa, as you see. So you can see the muscularis externa on the right side of the part that contains the duodenum is thinner than that of the stomach. Okay, so just above the muscularis externa is the submucosa. Right. Thank you very much, and I hope to uh, meet with you again. Bye-bye.